survival kit. Uh, most people actually probably don't know what K is actually means. K, um, K actually means type, and then you might know if you if you see in the characters, I guess. I'm, I'm not very sure. It's, it's just like a, this and then. It's a type, it's yeah, a it's genre, a type. It's but type. Yeah. Sekai is yeah. the world, yeah. so the, the motif keep on coming in the presentation, but right. I think, yes, everybody already knows, just a, to yeah. the, uh, just a footnote. Yeah. But basically, Sekai means that the, um, something like you and me relationship is directly, directly linked to the massive crisis or or if, uh, but I shouldn't say grand narratives, but maybe we should, we should have talk first, but <laughs> later, yeah. <laughs> uh, because Sonia has to live, she has a very important role today that they are funded the first female festival at the Eden Hotel. So I will ask you a first question, then you can go to your Thanks. Uh, so, sorry that yes. I have to leave early. Yes, so uh, I'm actually very, uh, uh, it strikes me during your presentation that you mentioned in, especially during the umbrella movement, that you're very aware even in that kind of uh, crisis and then the movement, which is it's so passionate and it's, it's dealing with the society and the, the city, encounter such a movement, you had this consciousness that asking yourself, can, can I be a, a girl? in that situation. And then also you mentioned in the uh, the animation Gunbuster, because even I'm hosting this event, I actually have never seen any of the animations. I have to be very honest. So I don't actually know what the Gunbusters, um, this plot. This is very old. Yes. Uh, yes. And so in that, in, in, when you mentioned about Gunbuster, you said that the, 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 the female characters cannot stop being a girl. Uh, I will want very curious this why there is such a thing that the gender become something you cannot get rid of or become very aware in especially in the umbrella movement that you just mentioned. Um, I think one of the uh, like so I keep on saying that like why why can't we stop being a girl or that like how can a girl stop being a girl? Um, I guess one of the reason why it strikes me as being. I don't know, I, I kind of want to know why I can't stop being a girl, like, and I start thinking about how, what kind of girl um, should I be, or what kind of girl can I be, and I think the, the thing that struck me as, like, I kind of want to, I, I won't jump to the conclusion that, like, people are trying to enforce, like, really established notions of femininity, precisely because we are in a very chaotic time that they want to find their um, I don't know, they want to secure their position in the world, that's why we are falling back to really stereotypical or really traditional um, understanding or like imagination of masculinity and femininity so as to, I don't know, so as to make everyone like, I know, at least somehow secure. But I think the, the thing that really struck me the most is how often I'm reminded of my gender like instead of like really knowing the reason why. Um, I think because of the, uh, I don't know, some of the expectations. Um, so I remember very clearly, like um, even before like uh, September 28th, um, like during the um, student strike and all of that, like especially during some of the confrontation, I think a lot of female protesters will have the same experience of them being dragged to the back because you're a girl. So that, um, so that, I don't know, guys around you suddenly become very protective, uh, which they don't usually are, um, and um, suddenly become very protective, and you are very, and you are very aware, like, now you're very aware of your gender, because people are telling you, because you're a girl, so you, you um, probably would not like to stand um, at like the very front line of confrontation because you would get hurt or like, I don't know, probably you can't move, move very heavy stuff or that if you are going to like a certain places, let's just say in the Mongol occupation site, probably you will be in danger. Um, it's something that people tell you. And um, I was thinking about because I was doing some sort of like filming work or like reporting work um, um, during the occupation, especially in uh, Admiralty. And I was like, so I was carrying a tripod, I was carrying a camera and I was alone and I was like, um, I don't know, just like flipping over barricades and like the shoot everywhere. And um, the photographers from like newspaper would be genuinely surprised to see me and I did all the stuff that I did. I was like, like climbing one hand over like barricade and fences and like, I don't know, walking into dangerous zones. And yeah, so I was like, like, so it was like a thing, like I, I didn't think about me being a girl until people constantly remind me of my gender. 
And um, so that was the experience, which links to my, um, like, Gunbuster is a really, really old animation that was broadcast when I was born. Um, so anyway, so the thing is, like, in that, in that, in that animation, expect, like, I, I don't know, like, from the, from the costume, you can see how, it's very interesting how even though she's fighting, like, monsters in deep, uh, in deep space, but she is still dressed in a way that is very, like, emphasized her gender and sexuality and her body as a woman. And it's just, it's just, it's just wrong. Like, for me, it's just wrong. And also links to what, um, like, all of you have been saying, especially um, um, the magic, magical girl genre. And it was like, how, how a lot of, like, um, gender, like, gender, gender traits a lot of like requirement we have for women are basically added or included in what it like let's let's just say what it makes to what it takes to be a magical girl or what it uh, what it takes to be a beautiful like beautiful fighting girl so you have to be beautiful right and you have to be heterosexual and like later on now you don't have to be heterosexual you can be homosocial but you have to like probably you have to be motherly you want to have kids um, you probably should not hate men um, and a lot of stuff, and you need to wear a skirt, you have to be young, and all that. And a lot of the times when we think about it, like, even though they are very transgressive, like, um, and groundbreaking kind of uh, representation of women, because they're strong and powerful, and they're very protective, they're very active, but a lot of the times there are a lot of other elements, very traditional elements of femininity we are still, like, um, projecting onto them, and we're, or, we, or that we are still demanding um, that of them. And... So like as from the, like I will just keep it short, like as from the umbrella movement and the sunflower movement, you can see how a very traditional, um, very traditional requirement of femininity, let's just say you should be morally upright, you should not be too promiscuous, you should not dress in very um, um, sexy way or all that is projected onto, onto quote unquote the character or like onto real life like female protesters. So you can't be a certain kind of woman. Um, um, if you are to be, let's just say, a protester, or if you are someone who is going to bring about social change, so you have to be Joan of Arc. You can't be like a promiscuous woman and and like I don't know, take part in a protest. So yeah, so I don't know. Like probably the world is not chaotic enough for like gender norms to die. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. Thanks. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much. Um, I think it actually follow up Sonia's. I think it's really good to ask Akiko. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, yes. I think so. So, Akiko, um, you have explained very well about the genealogy of the magical girls, start from 60s, and then it's, yeah, it's, it's talking about girls, but start from boys, and then girl, and girls, and boys again, and transgenders. So um, how do you think about that change of uh, formation about this boy and girl and girls and, I mean, it's <laughs> Well, you're talking about uh, TV animation. Yes, animation and mangas and all those. Stuff. Well, um, hmm. well, actually, um, in TV animation, but the Japanese pop culture in general, children meant to be boys, you know, in general. So the Tetsuma Atom, for example, it, the, it was really popular among girl, boys and girls, but the protagonists are always boys and men, you know, because it's a very um, stereotypical and it, it's, it's a standard of the popular culture uh, discourse. So in only shoujo manga, the protagonists are women, but um, probably the, uh, those kind of shoujo manga narratives are typically depict the daily lives. You know, it's not that, that kind of dramatic, you know, like uh, fighting or other conflicts in, being involved. So um, it's as you um, make, produce a TV animation, the works with boy protagonists is more like easier to be produced. So that's why the choices are almost all men or boys. But uh, actually, Yokoyama Mitsuteru, who, who made um, Tetsujin 28 Go, the Giganter in 
in English uh, subtitle, he um, kind of challenged that kind of environment. So he created a uh, girl protagonist and then, but uh, he was trying to make the story very dramatic. So then he chose magical power, you know, then the magical girl genre about the, pr pro uh, the prototype of magical girl was created. And then um, the maybe the change of formation, uh, it's, it's kind of long story short. The boys genre and girl genre are somehow merged in 1990s because the author of Sailor Moon, Take, Takechi, um, was raised up, yes, Naoko, raised up with boys uh, drama, the uh, suit action drama, like Super Sentai, Super Combat Team, and Kamen Rider, Mask, Mask Rider. Then she was great fan of um, Gavan. <laughs> it's very complicated. It's a space, space, um, to space police Gavan. <laughs> he knows that. So she was great fan of those kind of boys' works, so that she imported those kind of aspect of boys' genre into girls' genre. So probably those depend on the um, how the environment of the um, in which the author was based up. So the team formation was impo imported from um, the combat team. Then the Sailor Moon was uh, made with you know five different main characters. And then it's expanded, you know. Picture? Yeah, Picture is also, yeah. It's, it's the same, same production, so. Team formation is kind of, kind of latest, not latest, but it's sort of after I came up with one hero and one heroine, then heroes and. Uh, well, um, the Super Sentai, yes, it, it's all made up by Ishinomori Shotaro, the male author. Then all the super superhero or Kamen Rider, Rider Mask was, and then Super Sentai were all made up by Shinomori Shotaro. And then those works were produced by Toei. So <laughs> it's easier to, you know, get, um, grab those formation and you reuse the, those formation in Magical Girl Animation. It was also produced by Toei Animation. So it's, Actually, yeah, maybe if you um, try to um, solve those kind of problem, then you have to think about the history of toy animation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> mostly affected right. our children's culture, yes. Right. Thank you, thank you very much. So now maybe you, we have to talk about grand narrative. <laughs> so, so um, yeah. Uh, what's, what's, what's the question? The oh, question is uh, that the, um, you mentioned that the grand narrative is, um, rejection of grand narratives is one of the Sekai Girls feature, right? So I, <clears throat> but I think that the, maybe Uno is really against Hiro Kiyazuma. He, he used to work with Hiro Kiyazuma before and he just, the, the, the book is some sort of goodbye letter to Hiroki and then Hiroki was mentioned on an, on again and again about grand narrative uh, within the Sekai K books and also um, Book of Revelation is one of the Sekai K story or something. So um, I think it's very um, reason reasonable, rational. That's the uh, Uno against Atma Hiroki and, um, but how do you, um, um, distinguish the grand narratives uh, within Sekai Ke is the, the, the feature is the rejection. Sorry, my English is bad. Um, okay, maybe I can gradually think, <laughs> think while I'm talking. Um, but 
I, I, I mean, I, I find it, I, I still find it very strange in, in Japan, in intellectual thought in Japan, why Japanese thinkers are so interested in this idea of grand narratives or the rejection of grand narratives. Why, why it's a concept. And I even find really quite strange. So I, I really hope sometimes someone can tell me why, why Azumo Hiroki is interested in this topic. Because he starts talking about it, he starts talking about it in 1999, right? Which seems very odd because I think in Europe, everyone's been discussing this idea in the 1980s. And by the 1990s, we're talking we, about we things... We are so late. Which we're to, yeah, we're talking about other things, right? So, I, I mean, you, you could... Something, somebody like uh, Asada Akira, right? If you look yes. at Asada Akira, yeah. I think he's interested in someone like Deleuze. Right. Is right. precisely because Deleuze is one way of getting out of this problem of it's, everything's meaningless after the, the oh, end of yeah. grand narratives. Yeah. It's, it's his way of creating some kind of positive conception of how... People can work, how society can function um, and people can work t together. They already have this idea. And it's really strange for me that, that Azuma writes, writes a book on Derrida and then suddenly he goes back to talking about grand narratives. You could also, I could also argue that Derrida actually has some ideas yeah, about positive. how positive ideas about how society could kind of operate without grand narratives. And he just goes back to this very old yeah. idea from 1979 for a book from 1979 about the end of grand narratives, right? Just about uh, uh, the, the, the most kind of nihilistic version. There's no, there's no grand vision. All we can do is everyone can have their own, you know, small little ideas. You can just find a few people with the same yeah. small ideas I, and cooperate I, together. I you understand know. that's the uh, person from Europe or the States say, yeah, why are you still talking about? But it happens actually not only in Japan, but maybe in Asia. Because of the in 2000 or 2010, we are still talking a lot about relational aesthetics. Maybe you are not very familiar mm. with, but it's it's uh, the book was published in 1998 or no, no, 1999. So um, yeah, uh, I know that the European um, those art experts was wondering why Japanese people are still talking about it. So I think it's. it's sort of same thing, but um, the point is not about it, but I, I think that the Sekaike is some individual or some partner was really, I mean, it's as if I um, interpret as narrative discourse, uh, very small relationship or human circle was directly linked to meta-narratives. So meta-narratives could be varied, of course, but I think I'm sh very sure that grand narratives are included in that meta narratives. I mean, I mean, I, 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 also, I, I, mean, I, I actually have some other suspicions about why, why the idea of grand narratives is is popular in Japan, which is, I think, possibly one is a, 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 a lack a lack of academic discourses, philosophical discourses on other subjects. And I think the other thing is, um, I think that that idea of grand narrative. I think Japan is interesting because, um, uh, on the one hand, I think there's some problems with the academic discourses in philosophy and continental philosophy in Japan, right? Well, but on the other hand, I think that what is interesting is that because of the publishing system in Japan, I think the public have slightly more, con slightly more idea about some easy to, uh, easy to understand philosophical concepts. Right? Because that idea became popular in the 1980s, and there was Asada Akira published a very popular book, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. thousands yeah, yeah. and thousands of copies sold, not read by academics, read by lots of other people, including the people who yeah, went yeah. on to, to, uh, to make these anime, yeah. anime yeah, Christopher, right? I don't want to talk about the popularity of uh, grand narratives. I want to talk about Sekaike and grand narratives. Mm. That's my question. <laughs> I think it is can go on. We'll have a whole night. We have, it goes to a very philosophical question. I think we should also open question to the floor, unless people are also interested about the grand narratives in Sekaike. I think now we can uh, feel free if anybody has questions about the presentation down to the, uh, our presenters, please. I think there are a lot of yeah, animation fans. 
hearing today. <laughs> I have a question to Hitomi. So, because you are basically the curator to, yeah, to plan this symbolism, right? So, why, what you motivate to, you know, to organize these discussions and events about the Sekaike? Why the Sekaike is so significant now? Okay, okay. Uh, if you give me half an hour, I will show you my. No, you can make it a story short. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe some, because um. Yeah, I have. <laughs> but the thing is that the I saw the Thank You Once Pavilion show in 2016, and then I go around the Nothing with Drive Through exhibition. Did you did you see that? But anyway, you know you know his works. So um, I thought that he has a quite private interpretation of um, all those philosophies and then religious uh, or antagonism to Christianity. Through I mean. Particularly this work is, I mean, the, the other works as well, but particularly this piece is just a, his private linkage of um, his inner world, like Beethoven or uh, Bellatal or uh, Kubrick or Nirvana. Um, he links to Christianity and Nietzsche's eternal recurrence and, um, and Taoism and Buddhist and so far. So uh, Sekaike is... Um, if, if I say sekaike is the lack of, lack of in-between thing, that's you and God, or you and big story, or you and nature, or you and superpower, or you and spiritual world, um, it's, it's just between is just nothing. So that's the, I, I, just, um, I just felt, oh, isn't this sekaike? So I just was thinking about contemporary art nar artworks, which is, narratives, and then uh, that narrative is really sekaike, I thought, that, I mean, some of the work. So, um, so I think uh, the, the relation between uh, artwork and uh, sekaike as a narrative discourse is very interesting. So that's why I talked to Cosmin one day, so, so and Clea. Hello, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Hasekawa and also like uh, and Ms. Uh, and, and, and Akiko. And uh, the, uh, my first question is about, uh, I mean, the whole presentation or the, the whole presentation seems to me that uh, uh, Sekake is primarily a negative device. Uh, but uh, I would say, um, how uh, how do you come up with an idea that uh, it can it connects to uh, contemporary art. Uh, uh, even though I know that uh, contemporary art uh, deals a lot of things about all the discourse, but I, I would like to uh, I would like to invite you to uh, further el elaborate on like how Sekaike is going to like uh, do something with uh, the the visual representation of that. Uh, apart from the, uh, uh, maybe apart from the anime. I mean, uh, I mean because Sekaike is. Or very uh, story intensive thing, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, and um, or, 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 or I should ask one by one, or yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, my second question is to uh, is uh, just to uh, Akiko, uh, 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 because in uh, in the anime, I, 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 I forgot the whole name. Yeah, yeah, the uh, Mato, Ma, Madoka Magica. And then, uh, actually, there's a very interesting character called incub uh, cub cub which is in in incubator. Uh, but uh, how do you in interpret that? Uh, I mean, or how do you understand that in incubator in, in, in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, first the, the, the image of uh, the image of um, magical girls? As well as they uh, their fight to the world in order to protect something else, yeah. I mean, yeah. How do you understand? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. So, um, I think contemporary artworks always has certain narratives, and then um, also recently, quite. Uh, 
quite context-based. It's sometimes site-specific, sometimes really sort of community-based art, and then it is so-called socially engaged art. So, so recently, those uh, kind of works are really, really dominant in contemporary art world. And then I see sometimes the other kind of works that I um, introduced, uh, like like the 60s, 50s, and till now. And then um, I think that the uh, Sekaike is like really describe how all those, uh, not everything else, but some certain kind of uh, artworks. Um, well, in do you understand? Because I um, like, if you are an artist, then made work, and then you can make yeah any any kind of artwork, of course. But usually, if you use your imagination freely and then just um, touches some sort of like yesterday's Fuki's performance, and I, I I don't know if you see it if you saw it, um, like like he sang Home with sort of. Uh, he said that the after the performance, he said that when he sang Homei, uh, he is trying to um, imaginary hands he has, and then his imaginary hands is just going through each of the performance, uh, each of the audience area. So that's how he sings when he's thinking about. So it's something like you and some some sort of. Some, something bigger, something large, something, something somewhere else is just. You want to describe something else, something, some, some sort of. Sorry, that's that's the. I feel that that's. The problem. Okay. Um, to um, think about Cube as an incubator. Um, I have to elaborate the format of Magical Girl, typical Magical Girl. Um, in Magical Girl animation, um, there are female characters, of course, and then the fairies is in Western-oriented, which form uh, it's most likely um, to be, uh, let's say, the spirit or the um, familiar spirit. So. Those uh, Western-oriented, um, which image was based, uh, is a base, uh, then the magical girl is most likely uh, described as a witch. But it's very um, complicated because a witch has a positive images and negative images in Western popular culture. Uh, and then, of course, a familiar spirit um, always obey the uh, witches, so that um, that kind of familiar spirits also trigger the witch's power. But if you um, use the image of shoujo, the Japanese girl, more uh, innocent and more mysterious images are focused on, then it's uh, magical girls are moderately described as cute, powerful, but actually very um, kind of demonic in a Christian sense. But those kind of demonic aspects are deleted in magical girl animation produced by Toei Animation. So the familiar spirits or like fairy characters are always cute and then, oh, actually it's uh, related to the merchandising uh, because those um, magical girl animations are most likely to be advertisement of the uh, children's toys. So the familiar spirits should be cute and then, you know, you know adoring. But in Madoka Magica, it's kind of served to criticize those uh, idealistic um, aspect of Magical Girl. So I think the Kyube is a familiar spirit in uh, judged by um, the traditional Magical Girl uh, discourse. So it looks really cute and cat-like character, 
is should be um, you know transformed into um, I would say the toy true identity is the kind of monster you know he um, uh, gets the extract of Gaur's power, Gaur's, how to say, um, the dark energy uh, this, uh, extracted, how to say, okay, extracted by uh, the Gaur's emotion, the uncontrollable emotion. So I think incubator is represented as a, um, kind of the gender norm. So actually, it's, it's probably masculinized. So Kyube is try to control girls and magical girls. Actually, he could get some power from girls and then uh, let them fight eternally. So he is the mm, most uh, enemy for magical girls to destroy. In movie, actually, Kyube was killed. Miserably, have you have you seen the movie? Yeah, but still, Kyube didn't. Uh, Kyube doesn't disappear. So, actually, those kind of images re uh, reappears, you know, repeatedly in other uh, media, mixed media like Magia Record, for example. So um, I think that those kind of incubator are actually the monster or enemy of women or girls all, always um, appeared in front of you. But uh, magical girls never give up fighting against those kind of enemy. So I think that uh, Kyube is very, has a very important role to you know, challenge those kind of gender roles because in reality, mm, well, Actually, Japanese con uh, conservatists made a really harsh remark against women and sexual minority as well in recent times. So, like, like somebody mentioned that about the female um, applicants for the University of Medical, um, how do you say, uh, Tokyo Medical U University, and. Another uh, politician mentioned that uh, women without children are not productive, so we shouldn't put any tax to support those kind of in product, in, you know, let's say unproductive per people. And on the other hand, you know, like uh, uh, people with really serious disabilities got killed in. Kanaga Prefecture um, to one, one, one year ago because the, the killer, the murderer <coughs> said that disables are necessary in this society because they are not productive. So that kind of, um, how do you say, it's, it's really um, discrimination against the weak like women, children, and uh, section minorities, or all other minorities, are uh, getting really, how to say, stronger in recent years. So actually, those kind of situation are linked to the, mm, the, the kind of the, the, the recurrence of the mm, conservative image of gender in Japan. So. Yeah, maybe I should stop here. <laughs> that was also the question before. I would like to ask you to elaborate how is that the transformation of different characters to reflect to the Japanese society, but I think, yes, it is. Um, do we have any other questions? I was actually going to ask um, a very similar question that actually leads on from that quite well, I think. Um, in terms of how the male roles then are more passive and the female roles more active and 
um, maybe and more combative as well. How does that reflect on Japanese society? Do I kick off? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, maybe I should start with the uh, origin of Sekai Ike. It, it's, uh, it's, it's written as Sekai in katakana, and K as uh, the kanji. When in Japanese language, we have two phonetic alphabets. Hiragana and katakana, and Chinese character, kanji. If we express something in katakana, but it should be uh, uh, written as hiragana, katakana, and kanji, but it's, if, um, we have the different images about sekai if you, if you write it in katakana, because sekai in katakana uh, makes us feel that it's the distance between, there is not um, the existence of sekai or the world is really ambiguous so that there is no kind of um, fixed or solid world anymore because that th those terms are uh, kind of di disseminated after 1995 uh, when the Evangelion was broadcast, but at the same time, we experienced, you know, the sarin gas attack, like Chris mentioned, and then the great earthquake. So, the, we just witnessed the world destroyed on TV and in reality. So, we couldn't believe that uh, Japan is the most safest country, the, the safest country in the world. We never believe those kind of myth, uh, myth anymore. And uh, in 1999, it's a kind of milk mar for Japanese who raised up, uh, who, who spent um, uh, that is adolescent time in 1970s and 80s, because uh, in 1970s we we, we, we witnessed uh, occult boom. It's a occult boom. It's a horror. yeah horror, and then how to say <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, for example, Yuri Geller is, uh, <laughs> maybe you guys don't know anything about it, but uh, Yuri Geller is, uh, is, yeah, he's supposed to be a psychic. And then he created a huge boom in, in Japan. So you have psychic power. Every one of you has a psychic power. So those are publications about occult and ghost like, uh, how to say, the, the Mu continent, for example, those kind of, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> those kind of mysterious things, uh, kind of the main, main focus in popular culture in 1970s. And in that context, in one of them, who, which was really popular, was the uh, words of Nost Nostradamus. <laughs> he is uh, a philosopher and an alchemist in 14th century in Europe, and he left the verse about the end of the world. Then that was translated into Japanese, and then it says in 1999, the huge uh, king the red huge king descends to the world, and then uh, the, it's interpreted as the end of the world. So uh, those who spend uh, addressing time in 1970s were so scared. Yeah, the 1999 is the end of the world. So the great earthquake, saline gas attack, and then Nostradamus words threatened <laughs> our conscience. 
uh, to, at the end of the you know, 20th century. So maybe those kind of uh, instability or the, the threat are still uh, kind of, yeah, left, yeah. They put, put us our memories. And then we experienced again the earthquake in 19, yeah, uh, the 2011 in Fukushima and Tohoku earthquake. And then quite recently, Kumamoto Great Earthquake. And of course, the terrorism is you know, going on all over the world. So we couldn't believe the solid existence or the very stable world anymore. So those kind of collective fear can affect since the Sekaike narratives emerged. That maybe, can I, is that, is that a good <laughs> answer to your question? I don't know, maybe Chris has more. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I, think, I think the other thing about maybe Japan, if you're talking about these, these kind of issues, and maybe even related back to, to Japanese imperialism, is that Japan really was the only non-Western country that could reasonably claim that it could almost create another cent center for itself, right? Um, as an alternative to um, as alternative to, to, to Western powers. So I think Japan always has that, used to have, used to have this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of presence and this kind of destiny, right? Um, destiny in, in, in the world, right? Which maybe becomes less and less, less and less clear. And then again, after the, after the, after the, the end of the bubble economy, Maybe again during the bubble economy, there is this kind of idea that Japan offers some kind of alternative to the United. Or some people believe this, some kind of alternative to the United States as a as a center, as a potential other center or potential competitive center. They're all kind of told from a from a male perspective, right? We're not really we're not really invited into the world of the female to see what she's thinking about while she is saving the world. Actually, her saving the world is kind of given, right? We don't actually see her thinking about what, what am I doing, why am I saving the world, and it's just kind of given. We, don't, we have actually no access to this, right? It's all from the perspective of the, the male character. He's kind of allowed to prevaricate about whether to, say, whether to join in this saving of the world or, or not. It's always from kind of his perspective. And most of the narrative time is spent on his prevarication or and his chasing of or his chasing of the the female character. So in terms of narrative time, right, it's the male character that's taking up the the bulk of the bulk of the time in these in these kind of um, stories as well. And I mean the, the, it's kind of active in the sense of pursuing the the female character. He's maybe not active in the sense of saving the world, but he's active in the sense of pursuing this, the female character as the, as the ultimate, um, as the ultimate kind of goal. Maybe that's a bit, a bit different, yeah. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you know, I mean, I was kind of interested. Do you think that, do you think there were many, many female, you said there were male fans of some of the female-centered ones, right? Um, do you think there are female fans of these kind of male-centered male-centered narratives? Or do you think there's any difference between these kinds of fandom? Yeah, yeah. Because they, they seem very masculine, they seem really masculine to me. The things like Hoshi no Koi. <laughs> I always found it a very mascu masculine story, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think from the men's perspective, I think uh, Yohei just mentioned earlier, it's the, I mean, I mean, we, we're just chatting, and Sekaike is basically from sort of um, 
especially designed for men because it's for some um, some games and um, other so-called uh, categorizing CKKs, uh, kind of pornographic ones. And then um, I think that's for maybe maybe boys. Uh, I mean, male protagonist should be the. Um, I mean, male protagonist is always very human. I mean, he's, he's murmuring and then uh, doing this or what, what should I do, blah, 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 blah. So he's, he's I mean, just thing. And then it's very, very um, familiar with the, maybe those readers and the, um, consumers of the Kaike. And on the other hand, there's not much, not, there are, but not many uh, female um, fans of the Kaike. And then females are always, always, very stereotypical and then can have a superpower. I mean, people also, it's given, it, um, someone gave, but um, always strong or always, yeah, pure, or just also you mentioned, and, or, or sometimes mother-like figure. So it's very, very stereotypical. It's very inhuman um, female description in Sekai case. Very male dominant, I, I Then also a producer of Sekai Ke, mostly male, right? So maybe it's time for animation. <laughs> so we, we will set up a little bit and then uh, we will begin our long night animation. But Yohei, uh, we prepared uh, some introduction with the first feature film. Sorry, what's the title of the game? Title? Uh, uh, what's the mother? Uh, the <laughs> are they Wesley? Okay. Uh, ah, you mean the piece? Uh, okay, it's a Use Yachitsula uh, Beautiful Dreamer. It's from 80s, but it's very much uh, Hiroki, as Mara just mentioned, this is very Sekai Ke. It's maybe, maybe origin of Sekai Ke as time loop type. And then this is, I haven't seen this one actually, but um, it uh, should be very, very um, wonderful one. So please stay and then take a look at it. Have a break, we have some drinks and you can go rooftop, have cigarettes, we're coming back.